expert says gold could hit $100,000 in a very short period of time. I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, what might happen is Russia may start to sell their oil for gold. This is an idea from my good friend and macro expert, Luke Groman. To hear how this would work, let's hear it from Luke himself. Editor, let's cut to the internet. We're going to settle gold or oil, excuse me, in physical gold at a new ratio of 1,000 barrels per ounce of gold. And everyone is going to go, oh my God, this is a great arbitrage, right? I'm going to go buy 1,000 ounces of Comex gold or, and, or, or GLD, and then I'm going to convert it to physical. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to take the physical over to Russia, and I'm going to get 1,000 barrels of oil, and then I'm going to sell the oil, and, and I'm going to get rich. And the market probably is going to shut down. It's going to crash mm -hmm. instantly. The, the, the paper gold markets will just go boop. Cash settle, everybody. Game over. Right. And then you're going to, you know, the oil, the real value is going to reprice gold. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not saying that will happen. I think that's a long shot. If I was Putin and if I was pushed that far, that's what I would do. Mm -hmm. Because again, he already has the gold. Great. He's going to write up the value. He, he, people keep saying he's going to sell his gold. He might sell some gold. I don't know. But I don't think he will. Mm -hmm. Why sell your gold when you have the oil? You can use the oil to revalue the gold to give you all the dollars you need. So what would happen is Russia would say, we are going to sell our oil for gold, but here's the price. You're going to sell 1,000 barrels per ounce. Right about now, I'm sure you're saying to yourself, George, that's crazy. What are they talking about? Wait a minute, let me do some math here. Oil is about $100 a barrel and gold is about $2,000 an ounce. So they'd be selling their oil for about $2 a barrel. That doesn't make any sense at all. Who on earth would do that? Let's just think this through for a moment. So if you're a speculator in the marketplace, in the oil market, and you hear that Russia is gonna sell 1,000 barrels of oil for one ounce of gold, what would you do? You'd go out and immediately buy as much gold as you could. You'd want to get that one ounce of gold as quickly as you could. You'd want to sell it to Russia. You'd want to get the thousand barrels of oil, sell it into the market, and collect your $100,000. There's a huge arbitrage play here. More on that in just a moment. So what would this do to demand for gold? It would go absolutely off the charts. It might even break the market momentarily. And the price of gold would most likely rise until it got to an equilibrium point. Let's go over it in this visual, and I think you'll understand it even better. So we've got Russia right here in the middle, obviously. You can tell by my wonderful drawing of Russia. And then we have the speculators involved. So over here, we've got the American speculator, Speculator Sam. And he has got dollar signs in his eyes because he sees the best arbitrage opportunity of his entire life. But it's all the global speculators, which would include Speculator Sanchez, <laughs> right here. Speculator Saeed in the Middle East. And then in Asia, we've got Speculator Singh as well. Now, I'm going to focus on Speculator Sanchez and Speculator Saeed. Because if you understand what Sanchez is doing, Sam and Singh will probably do something very similar. And if we understand what Saeed is doing, we can really get our heads around how the oil producers themselves may take advantage of this incredible arbitrage opportunity. So to start, Sanchez would take his dollars, go into the gold market, he would buy gold. He would take the gold, he would give it to Russia, Russia would give him the thousand barrels of oil. He would take the thousand barrels of oil, sell it into the oil market, and collect far more dollars than he used to buy the gold in the first place. This is what drives demand sky high until we get to a point where gold could hit $100,000. It's that equilibrium point. Just in case you're not following the math, how it would work 
because we've got a thousand barrels of oil right now, about $100 a barrel. That's $100,000. So if gold, let's say, was $80,000 an ounce, then you could still buy the 1,000 barrels of oil for $80,000 or $80 a barrel. That's still way under market price. So the arbitrage opportunity would still be there, which would create more demand for gold until the price of gold got to a point where buying it to sell to Russia for oil wouldn't yield a profit. But it's not just the speculators who would want to get in on the game. Let's think about the oil producers themselves. So now we move over to speculator Saeed. He is producing all of this oil, but let's say that his cost to produce the oil is actually $10 a barrel. Well, if at the very beginning, he can go into the gold market, buy gold for $2,000 an ounce, and sell that gold to Russia for the 1,000 barrels of oil, that would make his production cost or cost to purchase at $2 a barrel far under his cost to produce it himself. So he would be in the exact same boat as speculator Sanchez. He'd be buying as much gold as he possibly could until the price got above the level where he could produce the oil himself. So said another way, if he can produce for $10 a barrel, the price of gold would have to get above $10,000 an ounce before it would no longer make sense for him to buy it at a cheaper price than he could produce directly from Russia. And the process for Saeed would be very similar to Sanchez. He would take some of the dollars that he has from selling oil in the first place, buy gold, take the gold, give it to Russia. Russia would give him a thousand barrels of oil and he would sell the thousand barrels of oil for more profit than he would have made by producing the oil himself. So the bottom line is until the price of gold got to $100,000 an ounce, because right now oil about $100 a barrel, there would be an arbitrage or a profit opportunity for market participants to buy the gold and exchange it for oil from Russia. Oh, time out. I know a lot of you right now are probably thinking to yourself, okay, George, I, I, I get what you're saying. I understand Luke's hypothesis, but at the beginning, wouldn't Russia be selling their oil for $2 a barrel if all they're getting for that thousand barrels of oil is one ounce of gold and the market price is $2,000 as of today? What you've got to remember is they're collecting all of this gold, which is appreciating in value very quickly. And it most likely goes up to a point where the purchasing power of the gold is the exact same as the purchasing power of the dollars that they would have sold the oil for to begin with. And those of you really paying attention will say, okay, George, I get it, but then wouldn't it be just a wash? Why would they do it at all if they could sell it for $100 a barrel? And then once the price of gold appreciated, the gold that they're collecting, then it's still basically $100 a barrel but you don't have the complete picture. Let's go back to 2014, and we can see that Russia has been stockpiling gold. Currently, they have over 2,100 tons. And right now, that ton is about worth $64 million. So if you take the 2,100 plus tons of gold that Russia has, and if you revalue it at $100,000 an ounce, that's over $6.7 trillion worth of purchasing power. And this is in a country that only has about $300 billion in total government debt. But I don't think it's just about repricing gold to increase their purchasing power. I also think it's about holding a reserve asset that doesn't have any counterparty risk. We all know that the West has implemented sanctions on Russia and made it very difficult for their central bank to access their FX reserves, which is basically currency, which as you guys know from watching this channel, is a liability of a bank that the West most likely controls. So why would you wanna be at the mercy of a banking system 
that's heavily influenced by the West? Well, the obvious answer is you wouldn't want to be at the mercy of the banking system. Therefore, you'd want less FX reserves or less currency and more gold, which has no counterparty risk whatsoever. But all of this pales in comparison when you think about what their end game could be. This would give them the opportunity to set up a currency that's actually backed by gold. And in a world of ever increasing inflation, that could be a game changer. We'll discuss Russia setting up a gold backed currency more in step number three. Step number two. So what happens to Russia and maybe more importantly, their allies if this plan backfires? Say gold doesn't immediately go up to $100,000 an ounce. Let's say the price of oil goes down <laughs> to $2 a barrel. Let's think this through. So I've got a chart right here of the top oil producers in the world. So it's the United States, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Canada, and Iran. There's several more, but I'm just using these to illustrate the point. And I've put kind of Team West in blue and then Team East maybe in red. I hate to break the world down by teams, but I think that's the best way for us to get our head around what's going on from a geopolitical standpoint. So Russia accounts for 554 million tons of oil per year. That's a large percentage of global output. If they start selling their oil for a thousand barrels per ounce of gold, what that means is it drops the price dramatically. Well, if you're an oil consumer, if you have to buy oil, why on earth would you buy from any of these other countries when you could get it at such a cheap price in oil? So what would happen is there'd be far less demand for the oil that the other countries were producing. Therefore, the global price of oil denominated in dollars most likely plummets. But that isn't where the story ends. Let's think about what has happened recently. The Russian ruble, their currency, has plummeted in value against the dollar. It's gone from about 70, 75 to today, it was right around 140 or 150. Okay, well, if their expenses are denominated in rubles, which the majority of the expenses are for the Russian oil producers, and their revenue is denominated in dollars, this means their expenses relative to their revenues plummets as well. So they effectively become the lowest cost producer in the world. Let's go to this bottom chart. On the left, we go from $0 up to $50. And this is the cost roughly to produce a barrel of oil for entities in any given country. So we lump them together by blue and red again. You can see this time, both blue countries or the West is at the top. This was from 2015, so I'm not sure how the prices work today, but I would assume that although these prices might not be the exact same, the ranking for which countries are the highest cost and which countries are the lowest cost would most likely be identical in 2022 to the way it was in 2015. But going off this chart so we can understand the concept, Canada, $41 a barrel to produce. United States, $36 a barrel. Russia was $17 a barrel. Iran, 12. Saudi Arabia, only 10. Again, you'll notice that the countries in red are all at the bottom and the countries in blue are all at the top. But unfortunately, this is a list where the further you are toward the bottom, the better it actually is. So if the expenses for the Russian producers go down significantly in terms of dollars, which is what we're worried about because their revenue is denominated in dollars, if at the time of this chart, it costs them $17 a barrel to produce, that was when the ruble was at 50 rubles to $1. But now, if it's at, let's say, 145, it wouldn't cost them $17 to produce 
a barrel of oil, it would be much, much less. And this is why I have this arrow taking them from a low cost producer to the lowest cost producer in the entire world. Well, if the price of oil is coming down because they're selling a thousand barrels per one ounce of gold, that's going to wipe out the West producers because their cost is so high. And who is it going to affect the least? Well, that would be the lowest cost producer, which is now Russia. So let's think about this. We all know, and we learned this from my good friend and oil expert, Art Berman, that energy is the economy. You cannot run an economy without the energy. You can't just say, oh, well, we'll just do without oil. That doesn't work. So what would happen is the West would become completely dependent on the East for their oil. Now, before we go any further, let's go back to the chart that we saw in step number one. This showed Russia really starting to accumulate gold since 2014. Why is this significant? Because this is when they went into Crimea and the U.S. issued the first round of sanctions. So this is really a wake-up call to Russia saying, okay, we need something outside of the system. We need to be less dependent on the current dollar system. Therefore, we're going to start accumulating gold. Maybe this was their plan all along. Who knows? But let's also remember in 2020, the price of oil went down way below $30 a barrel. In fact, in the futures market, it actually went negative, <laughs> like $38 a barrel for a period of time. Well, this shows Russia that, oh, well, wait a minute here. All of the countries in the West are these high cost oil producers. So when oil is at a very low price, then this puts them in a compromising position where they can't produce the oil without taking a significant loss, which means that over time, they would become more and more dependent on the low cost oil producers. So in 2020, they saw how this low oil price crippled the West and made them more dependent upon the low cost oil producers, even if it was for just a short period of time. But then now in 2021 and 2022, they see how this is playing out in Europe with natural gas. Russia supplies Europe, more specifically Germany, with the majority of their natural gas. So if Russia cuts off the supply, that means the price spikes and that means their economy goes down. So I think in 2014, they really recognized why it's so important to have gold. And then in 2020, 2021, 22, they've recognized how much leverage having the energy actually gives them. And let's take it another step. If the West is dependent on countries like Russia for their oil in the future because the price comes down so much, and if Russia, or maybe even these other countries, start demanding gold for their oil, then we see all the gold from the West go down to the East. So whether the gold price goes up to $100,000 an ounce, or the oil price crashes because of Russia demanding gold for their oil, it still puts Russia in a position where they are getting all of the gold and this ties right into the idea that I think has captured a lot of your imaginations on social media, on YouTube. What if Russia creates a gold-backed currency? Step number three, a gold-backed currency and East versus West. I'm not going to go over how a gold-backed currency would work. Most of you understand that well, and if you don't, you can find several YouTube videos on the subject, but I wanna go through kind of a thought experiment. How would this work? How would it play out? What would be the ramifications? Who has the advantages and who has the disadvantages? I see the world in the future headed down a path of bifurcation, very similar to the way it was when I grew up, when we had the Cold War. Back then, most of you remember, we had the East and we had the West. And the East did business with one another. They had their own kind of separate global economy. And so did the West. They had their own currencies. They had their own products. 
And I see this as the most probable direction the world will go in the future. So we know Russia and China have accumulated a tremendous amount of gold. In fact, editor, go ahead and throw up those charts again, going back to 2014. And we can see the rate at which Russia has accumulated gold. But China has also been accumulating gold since 2014 at a very high pace. So combine this with the fact that if, and that's a big if, Russia decided to sell their oil for gold, they would be a gold vacuum. <laughs> they would be the global gold vacuum. It would They would suck it all up and trade it for their oil. But it's also correct to point out the U.S. has a tremendous amount of gold already, over 8,000 tons, and revalued at $100,000 an ounce. It would give the United States about $26 trillion worth of gold. Now, we've got a debt of around $30 trillion. So many of you would say, well, that's fantastic. We could almost wipe out our entire government debt. Not so fast. Remember, that $30 trillion is just what's on balance sheet. If you calculate the off balance sheet liabilities, our national debt is far closer to $100 trillion. Many economists would argue that it's even greater than $100 trillion. So that might not bail out the United States to the degree to which you would assume just looking at the headline national debt number. But also I want to point out one of the United States' greatest strengths since 1980 or so is now, in my opinion, their greatest liability. And that is the fact that we have built our economy around asset prices, more specifically asset bubbles. So when you financialize an economy like that, it's incredibly fragile because we are living off of asset prices instead of our productivity. We aren't producing to consume. We are just taking the equity from our house and going out and buying all the stuff that's made in the East. Now let's go over some very important data. I've got some of the countries separated by West and East. On the West side, United States, EU, Japan, Canada, Australia, East, China, India, Russia, Brazil, Iran. The numbers that you see on the right to the country is their population. This is a big deal. For the United States, we've got 350 million, EU 450, Japan 125, See Canada 38 and Australia 26. But go over here to the east, China alone, 1.4 billion. India, 1.4 billion. Russia, 145 million. So whether we like it or not, the majority of the global population is in the east, not the west. Now let's go over some macro variables. Kind of the first thing that came to my mind when I was doing this whiteboard, and maybe the editors can help me out with a scoring system. We'll give points to the West or the East based on these metrics to see who would have an advantage. So we start off, first thing that came to my mind, as you can imagine, authoritarianism and tyranny. Well, for this, believe it or not, I'd probably give it a tie. I think that both the East and the West right now are very authoritarian. And I know a lot of you would say, oh, George, how dare you? How can you even suggest that the West is as authoritarian as the East? Well, I would grant you that what Putin is doing right now, very authoritarian. Same thing with China. And I would argue that Modi as well has fallen into that category in the past. But let's not forget what's happened in Canada, Australia with Trudeau, and the Australian government not allowing Australians to leave the country for the past two years. And I think a lot of us would define a tyrannical government as one that will not allow its citizens to leave. So in the past year and a half, you could have left Russia, you could have left Brazil, even Iran, but you could not have left Canada or Australia. So I don't think it's a stretch to say that when you look at the levels 
of authoritarianism, the West was giving the East a run for their money. The next thing that came to my mind was money printing, artificially low interest rates, or inflation. For this, we have to give the edge to the East, especially if they had a sound currency that was backed by gold. Another thing, demographics, population. We talked about that earlier. Now, China and other countries do have a big demographic problem, but it's not as bad as the West. When you combine all of these countries, they have a much bigger deficit problem than when you combine all of the countries in the East. The rule of law, we definitely have to give the advantage to the West. The woke agenda, the World Economic Forum, and the Great Reset agenda. This would be a huge advantage for the East if they go the opposite direction and basically give Klaus the middle finger. <laughs> If you look at the West continuing to pursue this path, to pursue these objectives that have been stated in the Great Reset Agenda, as an example, it's going to lead to economic devastation, central planning, and a complete loss of personal freedom and liberty. So editors, help me out tallying up the score. But I think based on just these metrics, we would have to give an advantage or the edge to the East especially if they pursue a sound money policy and a gold-backed currency. If we take a step further back and really look at the macroeconomic picture, if I had to write down three main takeaways from the East and the West for you really to consider in the future, first and foremost for the East would be the sound money, the gold-backed currency. Second would be most of these countries are relatively low tax compared to the West. Russia, as an example, income tax has two brackets, 13% and 15%. Third, in the East, we have a lot of energy and commodity producers. And if we go back to the discussions I've had with our good friend Art Berman, I think he nails it when he says energy is the economy. So you've got to look around and say, who are the low-cost energy producers. In this case, it would definitely be the East. Now, going over to the West, first thing that came to my mind and the main three takeaways here juxtaposed to the East would be sound money over here, fiat money over there. And I think this is what leads to these high rates of inflation and more and more and more, quote unquote, money printing and artificially low interest rates. Also, high tax compared to the East. And instead of energy and commodities over here, we have a lot of technology, but we also have this push towards green energy. But I think the key to getting your head around all of this is really to consider where the capital will go. My good friend Andrew Henderson says, go where you are treated best. But capital does the exact same thing. <laughs> it always goes where it is treated best. So in the future, if they pursued a gold-backed currency for the East, I think this would draw in a lot of FDI, foreign direct investment. And we always have to go back to energy. The West has some energy. They do produce oil and other commodities, but it's at a very high cost. And if they continue to pursue green energy and the Great Reset Agenda or the objectives of the World Economic Forum, they're going to be moving from a very high density energy source to a lower density energy source. And as a result, if the energy consumption has to go down, then so does economic output and GDP. So if we have capital flowing to the East from the West, how would that impact the West? Because most of you watching this video probably live in the United States and you're saying, okay, George, I get it, but how does this apply to me and my family. Well, we have to look at what's happened recently to the ruble versus the dollar. Editor, go ahead and throw up a chart. We discussed this back in step number one, but the ruble has lost about 50% of its purchasing power relative to the dollar. It's gone from about 70 to say 140. So why has this happened? Because people have sold their rubles and purchased dollars. So you increase the supply of rubles, you increase the demand for dollars. This is a result of capital flight. 
And in the future, we may see this reverse. So if we do see it reverse, where everyone is, instead of selling their rubles and buying dollars, they're selling their dollars and buying the new gold-backed currency, you would have the dollar plummet in value relative to this gold-backed currency. And if we do have to actually import things from the East, which would further exacerbate the extremely high levels of inflation that we have seen in the West over the past couple years. And when you get extremely high inflation, or more specifically, when people can't afford to put food on the table, like wheat and grains, when people can't afford to put gas in their car, does this sound familiar? All of these prices have skyrocketed lately in the West. What is almost always the net result is social and civil unrest. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here. I'll see you on the next video.